<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Reifenberg, and um, I kind of realized after watching so many people do these incredibly elegant who they are, how it connects to their passion, and how they connect to their work, I kind of missed that step in my presentation. And so I'm gonna, so actually, just by coincidence, my um, friend Diana Lopez Ray um, brought a, a book that. Um, I didn't, that I have not seen in, for a long, long time in Spanish. And it's a book that I wrote about my first experiences here in Chile, which I thought might be relevant to what I'm gonna talk about in just a second. Just out of college in 1982, I came and lived and worked at a small privately run orphanage in Santiago called Domingo Savio. In the small world of things, um, when Lucy and I looked at the Google map, it turns out where she'll be working in La Granja, the soccer girls soccer program, is about three blocks away from where Domingo Savio was and, and still exists today. And um, that this is a book that, that tells a story of a young man who came to Santiago absolutely clueless of what he was getting into, knew no Spanish, knew very little that there was actually a military government in power at the height of an economic crisis in Chile and came in with the hope and aspiration to save the lives of these young children. And about everything about this model, I teach about international development, is bad and wrong. And so it's a book about all the things that you should not do kind of when you kind of encounter a, a new place and a new culture. And I was very, very fortunate to have these incredible group of teachers who were kids from about three years old to about 14 years old that I lived with for two years that one of the wonderful things about being back 40 years later is I'm still in touch with many of them and many of their families and now increasingly their children and grandchildren, um, but have kept, kept those connections. And so I just want to say that the, the experience that I had as a young person here working in La Granja really changed the trajectory of my life and everything I've done. I got very interested in issues that deal with children, increasingly then issues that deal with um, public policy related to health and education, and did some work in public policy and negotiations. And find myself today as a, a teaching professor at the University of Notre Dame, um, where I teach at the School of Global Affairs. And um, I'm here at the, in Chile with working with the Universidad Católica um, in their college, I'll say a word more about what that is in just a second, um, but having this great opportunity to interact with some of their faculty and also do some research while I'm here. So I want to say a word, what I did plan, was say a little word about what I teach because it's really related to what I'm doing here. I'm very interested in pedagogy, very interested in how people share information with other people in ways that stick. And the Conclusion of lots and lots of research are the, the degrees that people make connection with these ideas for their own lives, make connections with one another, and that they have a purpose for what they're learning makes a huge difference in what sticks and what um, doesn't stick. And so all the classes that I teach, and I thought I'd say just a word about those, I, for the last decade, have taught a class called International Development and Practice. Every semester works with five or six international organizations pitch up problems, we form teams of students that do for an entire semester in a context that's looking about theory about development, but about real world issues, particularly in the health and education sectors. And these are semester long projects with undergraduates. About eight years ago, um, the, the, my institution um, set up a new master's program in global affairs. We expanded this semester long model to something that, that now extends over more than a year for the master students, where they're really working deeply with organizations in partnerships in different parts of the world, um, a semester preparing um, on a particular topic, going in the field with a team for um, a couple months and then, then coming back. So greatly interested in this connection between what you're doing with groups of students in the classroom and ways that they're, they're, they're actually constructing engagements that have impact in the world world. There's a third kind of line of work that I'm teaching about. And so these are some of the places that we work, but is it something that may look a little bit different? Um, I've been starting since COVID teaching a series of classes um, on something called mindset, skill sets and habits for a more joyful, purposeful life. So it's about student flourishing. Um, the classes now it goes up by a couple of different names, your art and science of human flourishing. And you might think of these first two examples, the undergraduate example, international development, 
this graduate school with these international partnerships in this. And it might feel a little bit like, you know, there's something different about these, these like kind of teaching. But I want to make the argument that actually there's something that's really consistent about, about each of them. And it's going to matter to what my Fulbright is in just a second. There are four things. One is every single one of those, and think it as somebody who thinks a lot about pedagogy, is trying to take ideas, theory, and connect it to what you do in the real world. And everything I do, all the development work, and all these work on these global issues, working with organizations, is thinking about how do you help, which was the story of a lot of people's presentations, how do you think about flourishing? How do you think about human communities flourishing in relationship with the natural environment? And what this, this most recent set of classes on um, the art and science of human flourishing is really think about more individual flourishing. How do you translate that into your own life? The second thing I think a lot about is how do you do that kind of work in a classroom that has an impact, whether in partnership with an organization internationally or in your own life. The third thing I think about, and which is really in contrast to the model that I said here of this imagined role that you show up and you solve somebody else's problem, you, you kind of save them, um, this, this model of accompaniment. How do you walk with others um, in the process of thinking about moving to someplace better? And it's, I think it's a really transformative idea in things of development, which so often we think of hierarchical experts solving the problems of others. And when you think about it, there's no one more expert in the, than the people in the community that know more about a particular situation than anyone else. And bringing that in dialogue with some kind of expertise can be really, really powerful. And the last thing is what I'm actually here in Chile doing is looking and thinking about teams and about teamwork. And how do you think about in the classroom, um, working from a university classroom, how can we make teams more effective? And so... At the beginning of every semester, in my classes that are all about working on teams, I always start off the, the classes by asking three questions. And I've never done this with a group that hasn't been in my class, but I thought it would be interesting just to ask those same questions of you as a little survey sample, right? And then we're going to compare it to what happens in my own class, okay? So the first, and it's all going to be about teamwork and your own experiences, and everybody should answer, even if your team, if your experiences at from university are a long, long, long time ago, okay? So question number one. How many of you um, have worked on a team in an undergraduate class that in some way included a grade? So, so how many of you have worked on a team at the university as part of your undergraduate education? Wow, almost everybody, almost everybody, a few of the older people know. I would, <laughs> interestingly, I would have said no as well, right? As a philosophy major at the University of Notre Dame 40 years ago, I can't remember a single experience I had working on a team, all right? The second question I ask, and I'll ask all of you, is, all right, so if, you, if a professor stands up in front of you and says, for a grade, you're gonna be put on a team for a significant part of this class, are you enthusiastic about that? Does your heart beat just a little bit faster? You think that's, this is a really great opportunity for me to engage and learn and think, look at how many of you think that? Okay. <laughs> Isn't this interesting, right? Right. Third question that I ask my students. So how many of you, you know, everybody in my class says I've been on teams. Most of them did just what you did. And then the third question is how many of you in a classroom had a faculty member, an educator, who helped you work more effectively on that team, helped you develop some new skills so, so you got better at working at teams, was very intentional about the process of working on teams. This is good, okay. So, so, this, the, so if, I, if, I, if I took the percentages of this group, it was almost like 95 said they'd been on teams for a grade. It was probably about 20 people said they're enthusiastic about teams. And it was about 25% maybe that said they'd had some kind of training, which is almost exactly what I see kind of semester after semester in my classes. And I think for an educator, this is a huge challenge, right? And especially, I'm always concerned because my classes are like, like, you know, advertised as you're working on teams all semester, and I've got everybody here saying, I don't really think I'm going to work on a team very much. So that's a, like a little bit problematic. But I think what happens is 
very often the experiences students have on teams in a classroom is because they don't get any assistance, they don't have any reflective process, there's no support for the process, that they actually come away with increasing experiences working on teams in a classroom and increasing either trauma or dislike or loss of, I think more than anything, loss of control, right? You can't plan out what's happening. You don't know what to do. Somebody else doesn't do their part. You take over or, you know, that it's really hard. And so that's what I've gotten really interested. What can you do in a classroom around a substantive set of issues that you care about that is thinking more intentionally about using teams? And, and I think the growing sense in places, particularly in the United States, is that more and more of this is happening. And so I had some colleagues here. So these are some of the questions I'm really interested in. Um, how can you make team-based experiences more enjoyable, more productive? Um, and what are practical ideas that faculty can do that kind of have you thinking a little bit more about process? So Antonio and I were talking a little bit about that. It sounds like he does a great job managing um, teams and, and with a lot of intentionality about the energy that that brings to the classroom as opposed to lecturing at eight in the morning versus what you watch of the energy. But the challenge is when that energy isn't always being going in positive directions. So what can you do to think about that? Um, and so I have the good fortune um, to have a long-term relationship with the Catholic University. Um, probably as most of you know here in Chile, like many, not most parts of the world, that higher education is professional education. You graduate from high school. In December of your last year of high school, you take a national exam. You get the results in January, you get a score, that with your grades determines a number that that determines, oh, you're going to study medicine if you want to do that, or engineering, or law, or sociology, or anthropology, and you become a professional in that field. And so that's the great majority of, of university education here in Chile and many parts of the world. And the college, as the name might suggest, that's the word they use at this university, um, is more of a liberal arts that you can enter into this space, not have to declare an immediate major. Um, you pick a, an area, but you also have to, um, so an area of humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, um, or math. And you also have to pick a minor in some other discipline. So they're very intentional, very interested in ways that students are getting this broader education. They've been interested in doing some really innovative stuff, um, particularly in places like engineering at the Catholica, of team-based, project-based learning, and um, are interested in doing more of that. And so the, my role here with the Fulbright is really working with some other faculty on uh, kind of creating a lab kind of experiences, share some of the best practices that are going on around project-based, team-based experiential learning. Um, interestingly, a lot of the typical, if we had a group of the, the typical Chilean university student, I think, and you ask them this question, have you been on a team for a grade? Most of them would not raise their hand. And so they're still kind of, except in some, I think business and, and engineers, we see a lot more. Um, and so it's really exciting to be working with these colleagues because they're planning next year, a year from now, to have an introductory class for all 800 students that would be team-based and interdisciplinary. Um, for all first semester, first year students. Some faculty think that that's the greatest thing they've ever heard. Some people are like, who is this guy and what is he doing here? And I don't want to do that. Um, and so, you know, kind of really an interesting mix of experiences there. And at the same time, I'm trying to work on a book that is really trying to be quite practical and pragmatic about how you think about doing these things. And particularly for instructors who want to do more of this, how do you bring it into the classroom? So that's the. Uh, the proposal, and um, it's um, great to listen to so many other inspiring um, proposals, but this is the thing that I get really excited about and I'm really passionate about, the thinking about the pedagogy of how you bring students into experiences with education, particularly with teams where they come out excited and more skilled in working on it. Thank you very much.